Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. It is truly an honor to be here in attendance with you all today, and I ask Allah to make this conversation a benefit for us all. I want to start with a story. Back in February of 2016, I was in Athens, Greece. It was my sixth Olympic qualifier, and I remember I was so nervous because when I looked at my bracket, I had what was seemingly um, impossible, one of the, the most difficult brackets I'd ever faced. The previous night, I was so sick. Uh, I had eaten some smoked salmon on my way to Greece at an airport lounge in Poland, and unfortunately, I um, was overcome with food poisoning. Me and, a, and a, some other ath US athletes had gotten very sick, and on competition day, I didn't know what the outcome would be. I felt depleted of energy, I felt weak, but I knew that the Olympic team was on the line. Like all of my competitions, I made dua, and I asked Allah to give me strength, to protect me, to allow me to fence for him and for nothing else. And win or lose, I knew that this would be how Allah planned it to happen. Alhamdulillah, I won my first match, and I won my match after that, and my match after that. Until Alhamdulillah, I reached the final. I went on to, to, to defeat the world number one fencer at the time from Ukraine and was blessed to take home a bronze medal. I celebrated with my mom who was there, with my little sister Faiza. We were so excited. I flew home and I went back to my normal schedule of training to my sessions with my coaches, with my trainers. I remember I went to physical therapy that next day. I think I got a massage. And I remember I was getting text messages from people saying, congratulations on qualifying for the Olympic team. And I thought, man, you know, like the Muslim community thinks I'm an Olympian again and I'm not an Olympian yet. I remember thinking, man, now someone else thinks I've qualified and I haven't, it hasn't happened. And to pan Allah, I got a Google alert. Um, I, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I have Google alerts about myself. And I got a Google alert uh, from teamusa.org that said I'd become the first Muslim woman uh, in hijab to qualify for the United States Olympic team. When I qualified for the Olympic Games as a member of the United States team, I immediate re immediately realized that this journey was bigger than me. My participation in the sport of fencing began from a dream of acceptance and inclusion, where I could pursue my desire to be involved in sport and simultaneously be comfortable being the only athlete in hijab. The opportunity I had been afforded to find a sport that uniquely accommodated my religious beliefs, where I could be covered and be in uniform with my teammates, was written long ago. I'll never forget those early years in fencing. In our family, we didn't really have a choice on whether or not we would participate in sport. More so, what sport we would actually play. I played so many sports as a kid. Culturally, as African-Americans, sport played a pivotal role in our family, particularly as Muslims. My parents saw sport as a way to keep their children physically active to have halal interactions with our friends, but also they knew where we were every day after school from the hours of three to five. I played volleyball, I ran track, I played softball, I played tennis, but in each of these sports as a Muslim youth, my mom struggled to find options for me as a young hijabi. We spent so much time in sporting goods stores searching for long sleeve tops to wear underneath our uniforms, to find long pants to wear instead of the shorts that my teammates would wear. And when I discovered fencing at the age of 12, my mom essentially just noticed that the athletes had on long jackets and they had on long pants, what we thought were helmets at the time. We weren't sure of what the sport was, but my mom knew because it 
accommodated our religious beliefs, it was a sport that she wanted me to try. When I would go to local fencing competitions, my parents were always so funny. They would say the same thing to me. They would say, okay, Ipti Hajj, be confident in yourself, do your best, but remember, don't waste our money. That was my parents' way of encouraging me to not only believe in myself and to fight, but that was a reminder of the, the financial sacrifice they were making to have me involved in such an expensive sport. I was always the only black kid in the room, the only brown kid in the room. Imagine being in a sports competition at 13 and 14 years old and being told by other parents that your hijab in some way may affect their child, may make their child unsafe in competing in competition. Fencing was one of my first experiences where I realized that my skin color and my religion made other people feel uncomfortable. I remember being at fencing practice in high school and hearing someone refer to me by the N-word for the very first time. I remember being told that I didn't belong in the sport of fencing. One time I was at a fencing competition and a parent, again, acknowledging me for being different, acknowledging that I was an African American, acknowledging that I was a Muslim, told me that there were African Americans and minorities involved in the sport of fencing in New York City. I remember being so offended and saying, man, this lady is reminding me again that I was different from everyone else. But at the same time, I went home to my mom and I said, oh my gosh, there are black people who fence. Like we went on Google, we Googled it, black people who fence in New York. And alhamdulillah, we found the Peter Westbrook Foundation in New York City, founded by a six-time Olympian, 13-time national champion, half Japanese, half black fencer, who grew up in a very, um, rough area in North New Jersey who was raised by a single parent whose mom wanted to use fencing to get him off of the street to keep him to to not allow him to end up you know on drugs or in jail she wanted sport to be an outlet for him to not be and experience the realities of, of living in an urban area in New Jersey she gave him a dollar to fence. Every day he would go to fencing, she would give him a dollar, she would give him a dollar, she would give him a dollar. And coming from a poor family, he, he realized, okay, I have to stop taking money from my mom. But he, he loved fencing. He used fencing as an outlet. He received a scholarship to go to NYU. Re, um, six, again, six-time Olympian, won a bronze medal at the 1988 Seoul Olympic Games. And he decided he wanted to use fencing to change lives in the same way that fencing had changed his life. So when I discovered the Peter Westbrook Foundation, there are imagined 200 minority children involved in the sport of fencing in New York City. It was my first experience seeing athletes not just be involved in the sport of fencing, minority athletes not just in the sport, but successful in the sport. Sometimes it takes us seeing someone else be successful in order for us to even envision ourselves or plant the seed for us to unconsciously graft our aspirations and our dreams. When I graduated from university, I was looking for a job. I knew that I had the skill set to be successful in fencing, but I had never been to an international competition. I had never been to a national competition. I had no world ranking, I had no national ranking, but I believed in my skill set. When I looked at Team USA, it wasn't indicative of the America that I know. It wasn't diverse. The United, Fence, United States Women's Sabre fencing team had never had a woman of color, a person of color on their team. There had never been a Muslim woman on Team USA at all. But I somehow or another convinced my parents to spend this money to send me to World Cups to different parts of the world in an attempt to qualify for Team USA. Alhamdulillah, when I qualified for my first US team in 2010, the Olympic qualifiers began immediately in 2011. I remember going through the motions, going to these World Cups, and when the Olympic qualifiers ended in 2012, I wasn't on the team. For me, I've, I've always been relatively good at losing in a sense where it never really truly affected me too much. I've always known that when even in the face of defeat, it was something that was written. 
I've always believed that things that are meant for me will never miss me, and that Olympic team wasn't for me. I was at a conference, perhaps this one, um, at an Islamic conference, and a little girl came to me. She said, excuse me, are you the Olympic fencer? And before I could part my lips to tell her, you know, thank you for your support, but I'm not an Olympian, my friend interrupted me and she said, she's not an Olympian. I've never felt so hurt and so defeated by, by someone else saying that I wasn't an Olympian. This girl is no longer a friend, by the way. No, I'm just kidding. No, but really she's not. No, I'm just kidding. It took in that moment in 2012 the dreams and hopes of a little girl that I, I really felt like I saw myself as a kid. I wanted that Olympic team more in that moment than I ever had in my entire life. When I think of my journey as an athlete, all those times where I could have walked away and perhaps pursued something where I felt more comfortable, where I could be around people who looked like me, shared similar beliefs and values. Anyone who knows me knows that I never take no for an answer. I hated to hear that there were things I couldn't do because I was a girl or because I was black or because I was a Muslim. Even, of a, even as a member of Team USA, I had people around me telling me that I wasn't good enough to qualify for the Olympic team or that I would never win an Olympic medal. I've always said that my journey as an athlete has always been bigger than me. Not only to challenge the norm and to challenge those whose mission is to keep us as minorities down, but also to help other minorities envision themselves in spaces where traditionally we aren't always welcome. A lot of people ask me what it was like being at the Olympic Games, what it was like standing at the podium, what it was like standing on the strip and competing, not just for myself, but for all of you. It was one of the most surreal moments of my life. I worked tirelessly day in and day out for four years for a dream that I, I was told I, I could never have because I was different from those around me. And when I tell you that I worked for every single Muslim woman who wears hijab, I, I feel it down to my bones. It felt so strong for me. Those, mom those days where I didn't want to get out of bed, when I didn't want to go running after Fajr, when I didn't want to work out, when I was tired, when I was away from my family, when I was, you know, uh, on the road for weeks and months at a time, it was in those moments that I held on to the rope of Allah. It was in those moments where I had people telling me that I would never be successful in the sport, that I found guidance in having a strong spiritual base. One thing that I've always thought about One thing that I've always thought about as an athlete is how do I leave a lasting impact? Growing up, I didn't have a Muslim female athlete to look up to for inspiration. I remember as a kid hearing the names of the great Muhammad Ali, of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, of Hakeem Olajuwon, and I've always in particular admired Muhammad Ali for his athleticism and for his prowess and for his unapologetic attitude. Like many young people, like many millennials, it wasn't until after his death that I truly learned the scope of his work. The work that he did outside of the ring as a social activist and as a humanitarian. He demonstrated to society that the Muslim community was and will always be committed to peace and for social justice. For Muhammad Ali being a humble athlete that essentially was palatable for America was never an option. He demonstrated respect as a boxer. He demonstrated respect as an African-American male. And throughout his journey, he remembered his religion. He remembered each of us. He willingly sacrificed the best years of his career to stand and fight for what was right, and not just for himself, but for all people of color and for everyone who has ever lived under oppression. I believe that every single one of us has a champion inside of us. 
I believe that we all have something so great living inside of us and we owe it to ourselves to figure out what it is. To use our strengths to be proponents of change, to be proponents of good, and to leave a lasting impact on this world. If you operate your life in a way to serve others and create spaces for those who often go unheard, inshallah your reward will be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.